You ever wanted to rewatch your dreams on like an, I don't, I don't know, like a, a VHS tape or something? Well, you see, that's exactly what this company offers. Well, isn't that great? Somnium Dream Viewer, to be exact. Uh, but, but it's never really that simple, is it? No, no, no. In fact, I think this company offers us much more than we ever could have expected. Why simply rewatch your dreams when they can flood the very reality that you live in? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so Dream Viewer is an analog horror series by the horror author Holly Fernwright, um, and it covers the story of a company that sells this uh, brain scanning device meant to record your dreams. However, this device is known to cause uh, quite a few uh, quirky side effects. Uh, I, I mean, it basically uh, makes the voices in your head. Come on, I know you have them too. It takes the voices in your head and it makes them real, and they can break into your house too. Well, well finally, this. This is exactly what I wanted. Now, with that in mind, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the first video, shall we? The first video seems to be some sort of user guide for purchasers of the Somnium Dream Viewer. At first, um, it explains how the Somnium Dream Viewer functions. It's basically just a head device that scans your brain while you sleep. Pretty much what you'd expect this sketchy ass company to say, am I right? So you know, the video continues to explain the already self-explanatory. The device scans your brain while you sleep and uh, oh, oh, oh no, oh, oh, what the fuck? Well, apparently this product uh, isn't as cool and swag as I thought. Because instead of, you know, recording the epic gameplay footage in your head, it, it just takes screenshots of the highlights. How, how dis disappointing. I'm disappointed. Anyway, Anyways, here we get an example of a dream screenshot. Oh, how, how very fancy, I, I suppose. In this clip, we hear what appears to be an interview from a man named Charles Crawford. He actually kind of looks like a Charles Crawford too. Wow, that's quite a talent, you know, to actually look that much like your name. Good sir, I, I commend you for that. He describes a dream that he had where he was in his own city, only there was absolutely no people and no other buildings. Uh, he starts making his way over to where his house should be, and despite all the other buildings being gone, his house is the only one that remains. Upon further inspection, he realizes there's another man standing in the middle of the street. Not just any man, though. No, 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 no. It's the newspaper man! Seriously, he, he says this guy is made out of a bunch of loose scraps of paper. What kind of a weird persona is that? At least make him cooler or something. Gee. He describes sensing a sort of, uh, kinship with this man, so he reaches out to touch him and then he wakes up. Uh, the next thing to show up on the screen is a Q&A portion. All of the questions seem relatively normal, until we get to this one. Why do I keep having nightmares? The company reminds the question asker that nothing they see in their dreams is real. And then immediately after, we get uh, the following message. We are trapped in your mind, waiting for you to return. Oh, so hey, they are real. Oh, they are real. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks, I'm just gonna go take my brain and throw it in the garbage. This next video seems to be your standard run of the mill. You know, you might be entitled to financial compensation kind of ad. You, you know, Mike Slogan type shit. You, you know that guy. When I take on the insurance company, I ain't settling for no small dose. <gasps> uh, now if Hoffman, Palmer, and Marsh ain't the most lawyer sounding name I've ever heard, I don't know what is. Uh, the narrator states that if anyone was diagnosed with sleep paralysis, recurring nightmares, or waking dream hallucinations, well then they can sue the fuck out of Somnium Microtechnologies and get that bag. After urging sufferers to get prescribed dream suppressant medication, we immediately get an ad for dream suppressant medication. And like always, the real horror here is the for-profit healthcare system. Then after the ad, we get the following message. Now, in case 
that was a little too fast for you, okay? This is what it said. Like lost dogs, they followed us home. Now the house is theirs. A wound open that will never be healed. Oh, how nice. Uh, here's a fun little activity the whole class will enjoy, okay? This next video is all about interpreting our horrifying nightmares. Oh yeah? What's that, little Timmy? Oh, you had a dream that you were being chased down by a crocodile? Oh, I I'm so sorry to hear that. But yeah, that dream was 100% about how your parents are actively filing for divorce. The first video goes over some of the more common locations you might see in your dreams, such as your home, the sky, work, and the labyrinth, you know, the usual, am I right? Uh, you guys have seen the labyrinth too, right? Right, you, you guys have seen, you, you've been to the labyrinth before, haven't we? The video says the feelings of guilt or doubt may lead one to the labyrinth. See the others trapped there, marching towards the infinite center, running from their pasts towards an uncertain future. The labyrinth traps us all. You've been here before and you'll be here again. You were always here. Comforting others on the path is discouraged. The labyrinth exists between us all. Forgetting is a quiet comfort. You will be watched from above as always. Oh, okay, hold the fuck up. I'm sorry, is that a sentient potato chip? Place your palms to the cold metal. Sickness is your way of life. Rotten a dream of awakening. Cast your hot flesh into teeth of cold iron. You were always here. And school! I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I love how this video literally just describes places and doesn't even bother to interpret any of them as promised. I mean, shit, I just got fucking clickbaited by a VHS tape. I just realized that. Fuck. This video covers everyone's favorite subject, hallucinations. It starts out with a clip that appears to be from some sort of vintage movie. It's basically some little kid complaining to his mom that he had a nightmare, and the mom's like, yeah, okay, Tyler, don't wake up Papa. And then when the camera pans over to where Papa should be, it's a beautiful eyeball staring lovingly at us. Our broadcast is then interrupted, and we get yet another ad about waking dream hallucinations. The ad plays interview from various people who suffer from this condition. The first interviewee describes being followed by some all-seeing monster everywhere he goes. He tries not to look at it because every time he does, he can feel its claws sink into his chest and devour him. He can feel it staring at him all the time, even through walls. The second interviewee describes something similar. She says that she sees it every day out of the corner of her eye, just slithering around. She hears it too, dragging its scaly belly along her roof. The last interview is of a woman who says she can hear her unalive husband begging to be let in, banging on the outside of her door. The narrator explains that there are medical facilities across the US that can help treat people with these hallucinations and assures us that these hallucinations are not real. The last message, don't show fear. Ironically, after this, we get a clip from what I assume is the older woman from the last interview. In this video, we hear her husband begging to be let in, and at the last minute, the entity breaks through the glass. Hey, um, hey, not to be the bearer of bad news, but I don't think that's her husband. In this fifth video, we can really see that things are quickly escalating, all the way up to the FBI. Uh, oh, I, I mean the FBMI. I'm, I'm sorry, what does the, the, the M stand for, huh? Well, comment down below, guys. What do you, what the M mean, huh? What that M mean, though? The majority of this video is an audio log from some guy named Cole Sharp, who also seems to be experiencing waking dream hallucinations ever since using the Somnium Dream Viewer. He's very much treating this recording like his last living testimony. He doesn't know if he's going crazy or not, but on some deeper level, he feels that the things he's seeing might be real. Upon first using the Somnium Dream Viewer, it worked exactly as advertised. However, things were a little off. He started to have unusual dreams. He says that all the inhabitants of his dreams started to become more reclusive, harder to reach. He also found it impossible to lucid dream despite doing his best to be diligent about it. In one dream, he remembers being in an icy blue cave with an older man. Deeper inside the cave is a house frozen in ice. Him and the man broke inside the house and made a fire with the wooden pieces of the house. He asks the man, why are we here? And the man replies, I cannot escape from here. 
but you can if you can break your fate. The man lifts his bony finger and points at a warped window. Peering through the glass, our interviewee sees a shadowy door on the other side of the cave. Initially, he can't make out any defining features apart from a black shape. Then he says he could make out more and more details that he can't even visualize now that he's awake, and that somehow he always knew the door was there. Soon enough, he starts seeing this strange door in all of his dreams before he wakes up, even without using the Somnium Dream Viewer. The door consumes him, and he's terrified of it. The next dream he has places him in the middle of a war zone. He's ducked in the backseat of a car while a friend drives him through a town overrun by a corrupt military force. Apparently, this army is known as the Children of Minos, and to them, he is considered an enemy. Eventually, they make their way to an older woman's apartment, who's all also part of the resistance. The army starts busting down the door, and he is told by his friends to run up to the roof. On the roof, he finds the creepy door and falls inside. He describes falling through the void for what feels like weeks before eventually waking up in a panic. Since then, he doesn't want to go back to sleep. Dude's getting by on caffeine pills at this point. Now that he's avoiding sleep, he's starting to actually see the door out of the corner of his eye even while he's awake. Well, go on, buddy. Just give in to your intrusive thoughts for once, you know? Just walk right in. Shit, I mean, that's, that's what I would do because that's just how smart I am. Now he can see the door clearly without it disappearing the second he looks at it. It's on the far side of his room as he speaks. He comes to the same conclusion that I did and determines that walking through the door and into the back rooms is the only logical answer. So that's exactly what he did and the recording cuts to an eerie silence. In the following frame, we are shown that Cole Sharp was reported missing September 21st, 1986, and the tape recorder was collected for evidence. This next one is literally just a video of what appears to be someone walking around in a hedge maze. The labyrinth? Is this a labyrinth moment, guys? Well, hold on. Are we actually experiencing a labyrinth moment right now? At the last few seconds of the video, there appears to be a cipher. You guys know how much I love ciphers. So much that I didn't even bother solving it. I just went straight to the comments section. After heading to the comments, a lovely user named Hixie2277 was able to solve it using the uh, uh, at bash cipher. Come on, I, I haven't heard of this shit. Uh, the message translates to Robert Fowler, Samantha Ingram, Athanasia Vlaz, I'm not gonna try pronouncing that, but you, it's on the screen, okay? Mariella Estrada, and that that's, that's it. We'll see how these names tie into the series in a bit. Now this video takes us through yet another orientation. I'm sorry, haven't we been through enough of these already? I mean, what the fuck? This isn't school. I, I'm a, I'm a big girl now. Okay, show me the real stuff. The narrator explains how most of us rarely remember our dreams, but Somnium Dream Viewer is here to solve that for us. Oh, okay, this is an employee orientation. Somehow that just makes things worse than they already were. Uh, the narrator babbles on and on about a bunch of corporate bullshit. You know when cor corrupt organizations try to convince you that you're actually making a difference by doing the bare minimum? Yeah, that's exactly what this company's trying to do for us. Anyways, I'm sure all of you guys are just wondering, I mean, who, just who is Somnium Microtechnologies? Anyway, like, who is the person, the actual living person that is... Somnium Microtechnologies. Yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense. Uh, well, according to this video, it's a group of four neuroscientists that started a company called Five Labs, named after their four founders. Hey, wait a sec. Here, we are shown the names of these scientists, including an unnamed fifth individual. You might also recognize these names from the cipher that was shown in the last video. And together, these four dirtbags are collectively the people behind the slaughter. Now, through this, we also learn that Somnium Microtechnologies is also being directly funded by the FBMI. So needless to say, this shit runs deep. And even our own government can't be trusted. Oh. Oh gee, I would have never guessed that. Oh God. This next portion goes over the benefits package that comes with being an employee at Somnium, including daily psychological evaluations. Where can I sign up for this shit actually? Hold, hold on. Where, 
let me get in my car. Here the narrator goes on to discuss basic safety protocols at Somnium, such as keeping the lights on until close of business, staying with a buddy whenever going to an unoccupied part of the building, and of course, not showing fear. Okay, again, with this don't show fear bullshit. Okay, that, that's, that's fine, but I've been working here for five painful years. When the fuck am I getting a promotion? Now, chapter three, evaluation. Please select the image on your sheet that doesn't belong. Okay, guys, which one is it? Is it the crab-shaped crab or the crab-shaped demon? Okay, snake. Headlow, so okay, I'm writing all of this down. Okay, got it, okay. No, hold on, what, what's that thing lingering in the background? Uh, can you stop staring at me? I, I'm trying to focus. Uh, okay, well, you know, I, I hate to be that person, but I, I'm going to have to take this up with the HR department, okay, for, for the love of God. This evaluation continues until we see the corroded remains of what appears to be Paul from the IT department. But, okay, I'm not sure I can show this on YouTube, so I'm just gonna leave a more pleasant image over this. You guys can just fill in the blanks. Okay, this next part appears to be a tape from the New Faribault Historical Society titled Neznavka. In 1876, architect Jean-Pierre Albusset, I'm saying that wrong because I, I don't know how to say things correctly, uh, commissioned to design a prison to be built on the coast near the city of New Faribault. As he did for many such projects, Albusset traveled to the site to survey the land and spent the night camping under the stars to connect himself to the site. It is said that that night he had a dream of a sprawling, spiraling corridor or corridors, mind you, of waves crashing at the feet of half-submerged statues, intertwined rooms of iron and stone. When he awoke, he set to designing the prison that would be named Neznavka. Upon its completion in 1884, Neznavka would house 999 prisoners in maximum security cells. And also, by the way, the whole time they're describing this, there's, there's just this peaceful, you know, delightful piano music playing in the background. So I just thought I'd let you guys know about that just to really set the mood here. I just thought it was so sweet. Borrowing elements of the concept of pano, pano, piano, popcorn, I don't fucking know. Neznavka was a space in which prisoners knew that they were always potentially under surveillance, but in what manner they knew not. It was a space outside of life. Nowhere in that place was there a mirror to see your reflection, to remind you of your own humanity, nor did the lights seem to cast any shadows. We were like ghosts in there. I would finish my shifts and go home, unable to remember what I had done. I did not want to remember. Henry Solomon, Neznavka Guard, 1889. I feel like a lot of people today can still relate to this specific type of work environment. I don't know, it sounded a little too real to me. Within the prison, it felt crushing, like a weight of iron pressing upon my body. I often forgot if I was guard or prisoner. My perceptions became as spiraling and warped as those wretched corridors. The prison was the same size as the world, or rather, it was the world. Bradley Soul, Neznavka Guard, 1889, or Sowley. I don't. These are these are definitely names, guys. These are some of the most names I've ever read. Our schedules would shift and change, like time itself was being rearranged. The stone walls of that place should have stood for order and pattern, but they became symbols of chaos. It was like being in a dream. All men were lost in that place. Albert Bremen, Neznavka Guard, 1889. This is also starting to sound a little bit more like the uh, uh, Thompson extension, like the more they describe it. There's definitely some inspiration from that and probably House of Leaves. I I, I don't fucking know, backrooms type shit. Al Lusset himself would refuse to comment on the design and lived alone in self-imposed exile in a small house in Chicago. I'm sorry, I don't know why I found that. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> On the night of Albusset's passing, the entire prison would burn to the ground, unaliving everyone inside. Later analysis of the blueprint for the prison would reveal that there was no kitchen built inside. It was missing a lot of other notable features. The prison was then removed from historical records and rebuilt. Before we can continue reading, a blue chat box appears. Arnold. I'm assuming this is Arnold Davis, just to fill in the blanks here. No way this is for real. Beth. What? I found the tape in the old historical society archives. Do you think they're lying or something? Not lying. It's just some fiction. It's like Atlantis. 
Plato just made Atlantis up as a bit. <laughs> and now people think it's like a for real lost continent or whatever. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of corroborating evidence that it was real and this was, what, a hundred years ago? I think it's worth looking into. Okay, let's not go too far on this tangent. I don't think this has anything to do with what's going on. Even if these stories are embellished, there's something up here. No way there was such a huge building that was just completely covered up like this. That's what I'm saying. Fiction with a capital F dot dot dot. Don't do the dots at me because you know I'm right. I'm logging off. Good night. Don't let the evil spooky ghost prison get you. This next tape appears to be a video about conspiracies made by the guy from the Neznavka video named Arnold Enigma. <laughs> the Federal Bureau of Metaphysical Intelligence, FBMI, was established in 1946. Oh, never mind guys. I guess we don't have to guess what the, what the M what the M mean. I'm sorry to disappoint. The stated mission of the FBMI was to protect the American people from paranormal threats. The secondary mission was to learn how to wield those threats for our own benefit. The Pentagram, FBMI headquarters, Richmond, Virginia. Oh, I, I get it. So instead of the Pentagon, we're getting the Pentagram. How do we know these people didn't just make the lab ramp again? Like, how, how do we know it wasn't them again? I'm just... <laughs> The directors of the FBMI are listed as the following. William Wright, Jacob Kessel, Martin Webb, Flynn Fincher, Samuel Mann, Leonard Lang. He explains how the FBMI has been interested in dreams since the 60s and entered a contract with five labs in 1975. After the contract was finished in 1980, the researchers formed a corporation to continue their work, hence the beginning of Somnium Microtechnologies. For unknown reasons, five labs stated there was no desire to continue working with the government. Obviously, we'd rather they were working for us, but they wouldn't listen to reason. While they had no legal reason to shut down Somnium Technologies, the FBMI did still watch them from a distance, intimidating them from time to time. According to Dr. Robert Fowler, the FBMI was trying to get their hands on the Somnium Dream Technology. In 1980, the Somnium team apprehended FBMI agents who were taking photographs of and wiretapping the facility. After being arrested, these three burglars started to experience shared psychosis and hallucinations. In these hallucinations, the three burglars recalled having a fourth burglar as part of their team. Both Somnium and the FBMI denied the existence of a fourth burglar. I still have dreams about that lab, of running through those corridors alone. Why do we have to go in there? Why did he have to open that door? Unsurprisingly, the incident received little media attention and was covered up by both groups. In December of 1980, leaked meeting transcripts revealed that the entire board of directors of the FBMI had begun to complain of constant nightmares. On December 21st, Dr. Robert Fowler was summoned by FBMI director Leonard Lang to a private meeting at his Richmond home. No transcript of this meeting was made, but based on Lang's personal journal, he asked Fowler if he was behind the nightmares and if they could be stopped. Fowler left without providing an answer. <laughs> he just turned around and went, nope, fuck this shit, nope, nope, I'm not doing it, nope. The next day, Leonard was found unalive in his attic and Robert denied attending the meeting and several of his coworkers confirmed his alibi. That, that does seem a little biased to me. Was, was no one thinking of that at the time? Uh, security footage showed no trace of intruders entering Leonard's home. The autopsy reports ruled it as a self-unaliving, despite there being clear evidence of total destruction of the spinal column. Okay, right now, I'm, I'm just picturing Leonard turning into a human pancake, and the coroners are like, yep. Yeah, oh yeah, yep, yeah, that guy definitely did that, yep. Yeah. That was all him. Uh, Lang was given a closed casket funeral, given the recent human pancake event. Of course, after this, the FBMI backed down from investigating Somnium. FBMI director Ann Boyle was sworn in January 1981. This video appears to be taking place at the world-famous, world-renowned Neuro Convention. Up next is a much-anticipated TED Talk from Dr. Fowler himself. Uh, he's basically just explaining how dreams work and are processed in the brain. Uh, he ties this into how research at Somnium has developed the ability to map these pathways and so on. While the technology is underdeveloped now, their team is working on making it more precise and less invasive. The company's main goal, however, is to really understand where dreams come from. He also discusses how the company has been experimenting on people with their technology. Somehow they are able to take brain waves and transfer them between multiple people 
causing them to have nearly identical dreams. Through this research, they have found several sectors that can be accessed through one's dreams. Interestingly, we see a few familiar places mentioned on this list. The Ice Cave, Hedge Maze, and Dark City. Oh boy, look at that, fellas. It's all connected. It's it's all intertwined, it's all coming together. In this next video titled Carol, uh, the footage opens up to a handful of cell towers. We are then shown the name of a company called Shascom, Shasta Area Safety Communications Agency. The following is a transcript of a 911 call. 911, what is the address of your emergency? The caller explains that they're at 143 Ridgewood Drive and that they need police officers because their husband's trying to break into their house. Oh. Oh, oh no, oh, oh, oh no! The operator asks what the name is, and the caller says Carol Davis. The operator explains that they're dispatching officers to them right now, and they ask them to stay on the line. The operator then asks if anyone else is in the house with Carol. Carol says no. Uh, they ask if their husband has a weapon. Carol says she doesn't know, and that he's banging on the door with some object. Uh, she says he doesn't usually bang on the door, and usually he just screams and calls her name. Yeah, because that's way better than, than banging on someone's door, just standing outside their house, screaming throughout all hours of the day. The operator asks if her husband is at her door often. Carol says she's been seeing him more often, and usually she just has dreams about him, but now he's around the house too. The operator's like, uh, what the fuck do you mean by that? Carol explains, yeah, well, since he's passed, uh, sometimes she has dreams about him. The operator is understandably confused and is like, uh, passed? As in passed away, ma'am? Carol says, yes, nearly two years ago. And then the operator's like, well, well, and you're afraid of him coming back? I don't know what kind of fucking question is that? Do you think she's afraid? Does she sound afraid to you? Stupid? <laughs> Carol's like, uh, yeah, obviously. And the operator's like, oh, so you're afraid of him getting into the house? And, and Carol's like, uh, hold on, and the call cuts. Well, we're not even gonna talk about the operator, but I, I do have questions. Uh, the footage starts to glitch out, and it cuts to a phone call of what appears to be Carol's family member. They discuss going down there to check on her to see if she's okay. Lori seems pretty dismissive and says that she was okay last time she got to see her. She says that the doctors think her hallucinations are part of uh, waking dream hallucinations. Arnold, who is also the same Arnold from the Conspiracy Theory video and the Neznovka video, by the way. This is the same Arnold. Uh, discusses how Carol has been hallucinating her deceased husband for the past two years. He believes that it could be dementia. According to Lori, the officers are going to quarantine her for two weeks. If she shows no symptoms, she'll be released. She says this will give her enough time to clean up the house and replace the door. Arnold asks, what happened with the door exactly? He says that someone tried to break in and a neighbor heard glass breaking. According to Lori, after explaining everything to the police, they started acting strangely and insisted on sending Carol off to quarantine. Arnold is skeptical and hasn't heard much about anyone coming out of quarantine. Lori is tired of Arnold's bullshit and tells him to cut it out. Stop listening to Alex Jones. She didn't say the Alex Jones part, by the way. I just I just thought I'd sprinkle it in there to amp up the spice a little bit. Lori expresses that she's the one down in California looking after Carol, and Arnold's all like, Oh, am I not allowed to live my life? Oh, is that it, huh? Lori eventually admits that yes, there is something off about it. Apparently, Carol had a camcorder at the time, and the police confiscated it. When asking them about it, the police denied it to her face. Arnold's like, oh yeah, yeah, typical cops, huh? You know, even though this guy has brought nothing useful to the table so far, I, I gotta say, I, I like his little comments from the peanut gallery. I, I quite enjoy them, actually. Lori wonders why they would lie about having the camcorder. I mean, what's on the tape? Arnold offers to come down there to help Lori, and Lori asks him to promise to keep his head on straight. Before the call ends, she mentions that even though the house had a surveillance system, all the tapes were missing. Arnold suggests that this was likely also the cops. Now it's time for that part of the video where we all collectively ask ourselves, 
what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> well, let's first start off with, with the basics, okay? Uh, the, the things we know for certain, if you will. Uh, we know that Somnium Dream Viewer is a device created by Somnium Microtechnologies, which was originally a company called Five Laboratories. And if that ain't the most Dr. Doofenshmirtz sounding shit I've ever heard, well then, Call me an idiot, or call me a doof- I don't- call me a bitch. Uh, interestingly, one of the videos mentioned that Five Laboratories was named after five of the laboratory's founders, but there's only four of them. Now, even the three stooges that broke into Somnium's creepy uh, laboratory remember that there was at least one other person with them, so these uh, two groups of people kind of have the same issue. Also, this device is known to cause a widespread issue amongst its users called waking dream hallucinations, and Apparently this condition is also contagious because in the very last episode, we learned that potential sufferers are immediately sent off to these uh, quarantine camps. And they're almost never seen again too, which is weird. Uh, either contagious or the cops know of a greater risk that they're not willing to let the general public know about. And of course there's also the uh, interesting mention of the Neznovka prison, which was built by our guy, uh, Al Gusei, after he had a strange dream that seemed to be describing the labyrinth. And last but not least, there's there's also our guy from the uh, evidence tape recording who described eventually seeing a door from his dreams in real life. So what exactly does this all mean? Initially, uh, I believe that Somnium Microtechnologies intentions were probably not as malicious as they probably are now. I think these people genuinely believed at the time that they stumbled upon some greater technology that can help us better understand the human psyche. However, I don't believe that the dream viewer is the thing that created all these monstrosities that are currently being brought into our world. Rather, I think that many of these things already existed within our brains to begin with. And the dream viewer simply opened up a door for that. And there's a lot of symbolism throughout the series that seems to hint towards that as well. Uh, I mean, for example, this is even indicated by the existence of the fifth scientist on the uh, the five or four laboratories team. <laughs> it's even got me getting the name mixed up, for the love of God. Uh, I don't believe this scientist was human either. Rather, I think they were potentially some eldritch Cthulhu motherfucker that wanted to influence these scientists into creating the dream viewer so that they would have access to the living world. Now the fact that this uh, fifth scientist even existed before people started using the dream viewer is also very telling. And even Al Busay had a dream about, about the labyrinth long before the Somnium dream viewer even existed. There's also several known domains that exist within the brain. Uh, as stated by Dr. Robert Fowler in his little uh, middle school presentation or whatever. Uh, how would these places be so well established across multiple people if there wasn't more to the human psyche that we don't necessarily know about, at least in this universe? And lastly, I think the little message from episode one really speaks volumes. We are trapped with you in your mind, waiting for you to return. You know, it's like having a little roach infestation, but in your brain. And sometimes they might influence you to do very bad things. So in other words, there are uh, horrors beyond our imagination living inside our heads. What do you fucking do? Just waiting to be let out if you give them a chance. So next time you think of that imaginary friend, you know, you, you probably talked to when you were six, well, well just know there, there's always a possibility of them coming back. It's never too late. Thanks for watching.